The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 666, for Sunday, July 16th, 2017. Folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab episode 666. The show where you send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, and we share, we answer, we do as much as we possibly can, with the goal being that each of us, every single one of us, learns at least four new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. And Eero at eero.com, where coupon code MGG qualifies you for free overnight shipping here in Crystal Lake, Illinois, I believe. Yeah. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, right next to Dave Hamilton in Crystal Lake, Illinois, this is John F. Braun. And we have a special guest for you today because it's (laughs) Mac Geek 666. So we thought of a guest no better. Than Mr. Guy Searle. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And here, in the fiery furnaces of hell, is Guy Searle. Forging the unholy alliance that has become Mac Geek 666. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, th- folks, the way we're doing this is this is Mac Geek 666. It is also my Mac 665. So after this finishes, you will hear, well, it won't finish. The second segment of this show is my Mac 665. Right, which and we've already recorded. Which, yes, we've already <laughs> recorded. We've already recorded this, too, by the time you're hearing it. Well, I would hope so. That's you know, unless it's like a Twilight Zone kind yeah, of Yeah, well, thing. we're going to uh, stipulate that time moves in a linear fashion. Okay. But I don't actually believe that. Well, in fact, I'm there certain are certain it does conspiracy not. theorists that say it doesn't. No, I have, being a drummer, I am convinced that it does not. <laughs> However, we will just, for this episode, we will okay. we'll go with so that. So we're living and dying in three-quarter time. That's it. Okay. Well, what do right. drummers know about timing? Yeah, that's what Ooh. I'm saying. Yeah. So, yeah, we are here at Max Stock. How you doing, <laughs> Mr. John F. Braun? <laughs> How you doing? <clears throat> Good. Good. Fantastic. Uh, glad to be out here again. Um, yeah. Because... Both of us didn't make it for various reasons last year, right? That's correct. Yeah, I was in Europe and you were at home, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, don't know. I don't know what I was You were doing. here. I was here. I can't you talk, I can't floor, talk about what You can't talk happened. about where yeah, you were. What, what right. happens in, in New Hampshire stays in New Hampshire. Or, or Connecticut. no, Connecticut. Same That's thing. right. All right. Um, let's Actually, can I tell a real funny story here? Yeah, of course you can. There was, and it has nothing to do with Connecticut but Delaware. Uh, I traveled with this guy and he used to go out of his way to, to take me off. And he was from Delaware. So to get him back, I would tell him that Delaware was a suburb of Philadelphia. Oh, wow. Yeah, he, he wasn't sure he liked happy that. with that. No, he did not. Yeah. yeah. That was important for me to say in your well, show. They're that was, that pretty, was highly they're... entertaining, Guy. <laughs> well, they're pretty tiny. They are they are. the smallest state or is that, is that Rhode Island? No, it's, it's the people that are tiny. Oh. It's, it's really a huge state. Okay. No, it's... Yeah, it's pretty small. Hearing the two of you muse about the minutiae <laughs> related to Delaware... Uh, makes me wonder why it's taken us 666 episodes to have you on, Guy. I think it's plainly obvious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to share some quick tips uh, that uh, that we saved for this episode, and then we've got some questions, and and then we'll move on to the MyMac portion. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. So the first tip comes from listener Robin, who says... And these windows on my 11-inch Air are small. That's not what Robin says. That's what Dave says. <laughs> and uh, Robin says, Recently I was copying a lot of Xcode projects where I needed to copy data from one Xcode window to the second. I configured my mission control hot corners like this. Top left is start screensaver, which also locks my screen. Bottom left is bring up the desktop. Top right is mission control. And bottom right is application windows. To find the right Xcode window, normally I would do this. I would move the mouse to the top right corner to search for the Xcode windows. I would select the first one that I see. And if that that isn't the right one, then I have two options. 
I can do a mouse move to the right bottom corner where I can now see only the open Xcode windows and select the other one. This isn't bad, but with all of the animations flying all over your screen, it becomes a bit tiresome and you lose your mouse position. So I looked up the keyboard shortcut for application window switching and found that it is command backtick, which is generally the thing under the tilde key, at least on the three keyboards that I can see from here. Uh, this does the same application window switching, but without animation, and it's a movement I can use my left ring finger for, which is already accustomed to doing command tab. Give this command backtick a try if you have not already. Thanks so much for that, Robin. That's yep. good stuff. Yeah, it, it is. And I, you know, this is why I love the quick tips that we do, because it's these things that you might have known about, and yet, uh, if you're not using them, you're not using them. So, so uh, um, as she's using, like, one of her little tiny fingers to... to, to I, think, I think Robin is male, but... but okay. D d yeah. Well, same... Uh, I was going to say same thing, but it's obviously not. Sure. Uh, would that make it a waltzing Matilda? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Yet again, wondering. Um, yeah, yeah. The question is being answered over and <laughs> over again. Now, to add to that... <laughs> Well, this is technical. Oh, okay. I'm not going to try to be funny like I. But um, right. no, what I what I learned also, I was like, you know, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting shortcut. Let me uh, let me see if that's in the Apple official keyboard shortcut list. And as it turns out, it's not. But then, a happy accident occurred. If you go into the Finder and you look in the Window menu in the Finder, there's yeah. a shortcut called Cycle Through Windows, and it's Command Backtick. Interesting, because I'm in Evernote, which is where I, I, we manage the show from, and, uh, and Command Backtick works, but it does not show up in the window menu. Ooh. So, who knows? Who knows? Hmm. All right, another quick tip from Harvey. Harvey writes, as soon as I can bring it up, in episode 664, you mentioned that by tapping on the screen, you can reverse the direction of how you scan to view when taking panoramic pictures on your iPhone. Did you also know that you do not have to tap the record button to stop your recording? Once you tap the record button and start doing your panoramic scan, just reverse the direction of your scan and it will automatically stop the recording. This prevents a lot of wobbling at the end of your Panama photos. I think that's pretty smart. That is pretty smart. Yeah, had no idea. Who knew? That's what I love about this. Well, stuff. I think I think John, the uh, the the photographer, and, and what, what did you have on your business card? Uh, oh, it, well, they don't know this yet if they're listening just to Mac Geek yeah, but uh, but I think that's John F. Braun, not terrible photographer, Esquire. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yes, that's right. That'll that'll be in the next segment, folks. Um, I have some quick tips. We prepped a bunch of quick tips, uh, but I found I have three, I think three, four. That, uh, that came up today that I learned uh, from sessions here at MacStock. And so those are the ones that I'm going to share here. Um, the first is if you like using tabbed windows in the Finder, Chuck Joyner's session this morning, he was talking about tips for your Mac, and you can create tabs and all of that thing. The one thing that I, uh, that I did not know is that in that same window menu, in the Finder, you have Merge All Windows, and that will take all of your Finder windows and merge them into one as tabs. Yes. Which is really handy to consolidate things, especially if you want to copy files around, because you can copy to the tabs. Really, really handy. So uh, so there's a tip that I learned. Did you know that one, John? No. No? See? That's, uh, that's why we do what we do. Yeah, I've actually used that on a, a number of occasions. There you go. It's very handy. It's handy. Yeah, right. Uh, and that's why we do these quick tips. Uh, Dave Ginsburg did a session about the iPhone and uh, iOS tips. And the one that blew me away was 3D Touch. I've all but forgotten about 3D Touch even existing on my phone. And, uh, and he had Control Center up. And he 3D touched on the clock icon, whatever it is, the timer icon uh, in Control Center. And... You're able to start 5, 10, and 20-minute timers right from there. Yeah, those were the defaults. Those are the defaults. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. The, the one that really blew me away was when he was adding widgets or taking widgets out and then just t putting his finger on them and reordering them where they oh. show up in that list. Yeah, with the little hamburger menu on the right. Yeah, that was so cool. Yeah. Awesome. And in that 
same screen. We may have talked about it before, but I, I'm always tickled by the one with the flashlight, where if you hold yes. down, you get low, medium, and high brightness on the LED flashlight. Totally forgot about that one. Yeah. Yep. I know. It's pretty cool. So Dave if, Ginsburg knows his stuff. Dave, oh, Dave Ginsburg definitely knows his stuff. The, the, I think some, if not all, of that goes away in iOS 11, or at least has in some of the betas that have been out. I don't have iOS 11 installed on a 3D Touch capable device, so I can't test that. But I've, but heard, actually, I've it, heard tell of that, yeah. Well, it's my, worth checking your apps, because a lot of them, um, developers over time will add... I guess maybe due to popular demand from the users, they'll add what seems to be something useful. Um, so seems hey, if you got a few be. moments, you know, 3D touch everything on your phone and see what comes up. Now, and all likelihood was, something will happen. What was the the first phone that allowed you to do 3D touch? I want to say the because I've got a six, six plus six S, I think. So the I can't see. I can't yeah, use it. Six S oh. is is what brought it in. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sucks uh, to be me. That's always kind of been a minor <laughs> annoyance to me because technically there no, there's no reason they couldn't uh, put it in I the six. Think, well, I think you could add something 3D touch like. Um, like they have. I mean, if you if you long hold, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Which uh, I think that's what David was actually doing on screen. Oh, is that? I think no, he was, he was doing, 3D touching. Was he 3D yeah, touching? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because it because long hold doesn't do those things. So yeah. All right. Uh, another one, actually, that happened when you and I were chit-chatting. You were saying that you had something on your phone that was using a bunch of cellular data. And I said, uh, th- and this is the, here's the quick tip, if you want to see app-specific usage of your cellular data, your phone tracks that for you. If you go into settings and go into cellular and just wait a second, a list of all of your apps will come up at the bottom. What that list is mainly for is turning on or off the ability for that specific app to, to speak uh, data over the cellular connection. But it also shows you how much data it's used since the last time you manually reset your cellular counter. Mm. So you can, you can see what it's using, and then, of course, you can manually reset your cellular counter at the bottom of that screen, and, uh, and there you go. Well, you'd also want to, you know, if you've got a runaway process... On an iOS app, you'd, you'd want to be able to see which one was using the most data so that you could yeah. shut it down completely. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. 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 So there you God, go. God, it sounds just like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Holy. I suspect it's because I was recently in Manhattan for a couple of days for, for various events. Yeah. And usually when I'm about town, we have, uh, but my ISP offers Wi Fi. So, uh, so I must have just been running something and I didn't realize. It was chewing my data seriously. I'm down to like seventy, to like twenty five percent, and I have like three weeks left. So I think <laughs> the whole I think month, I'm going to yeah. have to. Well, actually, what Verizon does now is I do believe they will not shut you off, but they will they will reduce you to three G, um, unless oh, okay. you buy more. Okay. So it's not like they totally cut you off, but I'll get slower performance. So it may be okay. Yeah. Well, that's not that's not terrible if that's all we do. Yeah. Yeah. One last quick tip. Uh, from Allison Sheridan's password manager yeah. session here. She uh, she mentioned a great site that was put together by Bart Bouchot. called xkpasswd.net. So mm. xkpasswd.net. And it is built to help you build a memorable yet very hard to guess single password that you could then use for things like one password or last pass or even your Apple ID, the passwords, the, the, the few passwords that you can't store in a password ma- password manager that you have to type in occasionally. And uh, so xkpasswd.net will help you generate these passwords. Yeah, so I'd forgotten about that. I, had, I, I, don't, I don't know that I ever knew about it. So uh, Well, you've been on his podcast, right? I have. Let's talk Apple. It's, uh, I've been on podcasts with Bart. I don't know if I've been on that one, but I certainly know Bart. Yeah. 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 So uh, so we will put all of that stuff in the show notes. John, do you want to... Uh, that's the end of my quick tips, uh, and I think that's the end of our quick tips for this episode, but uh, we've got... We've got a few questions. We'll see how many of them we can get through. Do you want to uh, you want to take us, John, since you're the yeah. one that prepped all these? All right, sweet. I will kick it off with Bruce here, and uh, this is a great question. And Bruce asks, hi, guys. Are you aware of any kind of add-on you can add to Apple Mail, which would then give you a... Oh, and there's a page break right there. But I think his uh, question is, give you an indication that someone has 
opened your email. Um, okay, and then the, the next part of this here is, some services use and include JPEG in the message, which is how they get information back to confirm the message has been read. Any ideas? Yes, I got several ideas about this. So, um, sadly, while the email standards support this, and that you can put something in the header of an email that you send out that will request a read receipt, uh, most clients ignore it. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. Uh, well, we're talking about consumer-grade <clears throat> mail programs. Yes. So, r regular email, it can be requested, but it rarely happens. Um, there is something you can do. I found an article at LifeWire.com, and it basically instructs you on how to put a request read receipt, or I think send disposition. Um, it's in the article. You can read it. But you can actually do a default writes from the terminal and insert this header in emails that you send out. And I actually have had uh, mostly people running Outlook for some bizarre reason. Certain implementations of Outlook honor this thing. And I'll get an email back from the person saying, yeah, they read it. Or, no, they didn't read it. Um, but in general, it's ignored. Uh, my best advice here, what you can do is um, you know, just search for email read receipts. There are various services that will do what he suggested, is that they embed what some what many call a web bug, and it's basically a one-by-one -one image in an outgoing email, and when somebody opens it, it registers with a server, and it says, yep, that's been read. Um, but would that, I don't be, have any, would that uh, be limited to when the person actually opened it, or, or when the email arrived well, on the server well, for the person? Well, it's essentially to loading an image, so they have to open it and okay. have an option to load images and it I mean it's kind of sneaky it's a one by one thing they're not going to see it nor know that it's happening unless they have some software that detects a outgoing thing absolutely nothing sneaky about that at all <laughs> um, I, I would I would throw mail Butler which we've talked about uh, on a few shows recently into the ring it's a plug-in for Apple mail and that's one of the things it can do is it can it, it will do that for you is, is it can big. embed that yep. tracker yep and uh, and it'll help you do that okay I think, I think with the free version, you get a limited number. I think you get a limited number of what they call um, premium events or something per month, and and I think that's one of them. So, but you can, you know, that's right. their business. You can buy more. Um, yeah. The indication I also got is that if you work in a closed email ecosystem like Outlook, um, read receipts can be requested, but that's outside of the scope of this. I think he was looking for a general solution for just regular emails. No, but you're, yeah, yeah, you're right about that. That, yeah, a corporate email often has this included in it. Yeah, or yeah. Um, or like yeah. I, I saw references Google, if you're all based on like Google Enterprise email, uh, outsource type of thing. So, um, so I think that's really it. Actually, yeah. another thing I'll mention is that, Dave, we, uh, we've used MailChimp in the past to uh, send out emails to confirm people's address and one of their features, because they're really a web-based service that generates emails, one of the things they advertise that they can do as well is, is to indicate if an email was opened, as well as you know pro provide email address hygiene and stuff like that. The thing I'll close with here is, although you can tell if someone has opened, perhaps using a third-party service, you can tell that someone has it. opened your email doesn't mean that they've understood it. Yeah, so. e right. Reading, e opening, reading, and understanding are three different things. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I, uh, before we jump to the next question, I do want to talk about our two sponsors for Mac Geek Gab today. Uh, our first is Otherworld Computing, who uh, happened to be like literally sitting uh, across from us here at MacStock in the common area. OWC is, as we have said many times, uh, the place where John and I generally go first when it's time yep. to buy a peripheral. Um, and, you know, it, 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 whether you need... Uh, an external hard drive or an SSD or you want like their new Thunderbolt 3 dock or even their existing Thunderbolt 2 dock. I really like their uh, Thunderbolt and USB drive docks that they have where you can put external hard drives in them uh, without having to put those in cases. So it's this thing that just hangs off your computer. If you have a drive you need to put in, you just drop it in, and boom, it's mounted. You're not using a screwdriver to you know, mount the stupid thing in a case just to get right. data it's off like of it. It's like a toaster. It's like a toaster. That's exactly what it looks like. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, really awesome stuff. They understand every bit of tech that they sell. Let me say that again. 
They understand every bit of tech that they sell. That's really important these days. Can I give you a great example? Sure. Just recently, um, I've got this 2013, uh, early 2013 MacBook Pro. Had a 250 gig SSD in it, too small. So two days before I was going to leave on this trip, it was like, God, can I get a one terabyte SSD that quickly? And, you know, of course, the first place I go to look for stuff like that is MacSales.com, OWC. And sure enough, they said, oh, yeah, we can get that to you in a single day. It was like, really? And you're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The next day I had it. And not only did they send me the drive, but because I got the, the kit that comes with it, it came with a uh, an external case that I could put the existing SSD. Oh, that the was one in. you're removing. Right. Yep. Put that into the existing case, came with a cable for that to go right into the computer. And they included all the screwdrivers and everything that I needed to take the back of the, the MacBook Pro off. I didn't need anything else. 100% of it was in the 100% box. 100% of it was there. And it was, it was ridiculously, I mean, yeah, it was an, an, sure. an extra cost beyond the ESSD, but it was, it was ridiculously inexpensive. And if you, if you had called them for tech support, they would have understood exactly what you were doing. And, and, and even the fact that they sent you all the, the right stuff, that's a testament to it. So you got to check them out. MaxSales.com, our huge thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring Let's wave at them. this episode. We Thank wave you, Max Sales. They don't know. Thanks, guys. <laughs> our second sponsor for this episode is Eero at EERO.com. Eero is uh, the most mature of the mesh Wi-Fi solutions in the market today. They've been out the longest, uh, which means that they've been around about two years, at least in the market. And they just released their second generation system, which means that in their base units, they now have a third radio. So they have a 2.4 gigahertz radio and two five gigahertz radios. What this means is they can, and they, they dynamically assign these radios on the fly. But what it means is things can be a lot more efficient either for the backhaul between all of your Eero units or, or perhaps also for the front haul where you've got all your clients connecting. Things are going twice as fast with their true mesh now with the additional radio. They also added a product called Beacon. Uh, the Beacon has two radios, but it has been tweaked so that it's, I think, about 30% faster than the original Eero. And the cool part about the Beacon is you just plug it into a wall outlet and it sits right there. You don't have to plug any wires in, uh, even for power. It literally just sits there, doesn't take up any space on your table, and will take care of getting you Wi-Fi bliss. So you've got to check this out. Um, you know, the single router model just doesn't work in many, many cases. If you've got dead spots in your home, it's because you don't have an access point within range of where you need your, or where you bring your devices. That's what Mesh is for. It's all distributed. It's all configured from a single interface. You do it from your phone. You don't have to manage each device individually. It's all one thing. They're all aware of each other, and they talk with each other that way, your devices are always connected to the right one, and you just get blanket coverage throughout your house without having to think about it. Enterprise-grade Wi-Fi in your home in just a few minutes. Here's the deal. If you go to Eero.com, E-E-R-O.com, make your purchase, add overnight shipping to your order, it'll charge you, or it'll, it'll say it's going to charge you for it. Then when you add coupon code... MGG or promo code MGG, it will not charge you for overnight shipping. So you can have your Eero system in one business day. Go to eero.com, add overnight shipping, add the promo code MGG. That will make the overnight shipping free and you will have Wi Fi bliss very, very quickly. Our huge thanks to Eero for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. All right, what's the next question, John? Well, Douglas has a question. He actually has two questions. We'll answer the first one and answer the other one later. Um, my brother has a 27-inch iMac running Sierra 10.12.5. Everything is up to date. His internet access is through AT&T U-verse. The iMac is directly connected to the U-verse via LAN cable. The U-verse modem also puts out his Wi-Fi signal for his iPad. So here's the problem. 
Whenever he wakes his iMac up from sleep, it takes about a minute for his internet connection on his iMac to kick in. For example, if he clicks on a bookmark in Safari just after waking his Mac, Safari will tell him that he is not connected to the internet. After a short time, 30 to 60 seconds, the web page will load. After that, everything is fine. Well, my brother is getting a little frustrated with having to wait each time he wakes the iMac. When using Wi-Fi with his iPad, the connection is immediate. I have checked his internet settings, and everything seems fine as far as I can tell, though I'm in no means an expert. Oh. Uh, you guys are the experts. Okay. <laughs> so I was wondering what you think the problem may be. This is one of those... I've, I've, have you experienced this before, John? No. Oh, I, I, I get this from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. And while I was reading the question, I have some additional thoughts. But let me give you some of my first thoughts here. Okay. All right. So clearly, it's a problem with the iMac and not the iPad since the iPad reacts. Well, yeah. Instance, the observation instantly. is that the iPad always works and the iMac, uh, it takes it a while to get a connection. Uh, yeah. I'll okay. give you that. Sure. So sure. I'll speculate that the problem is localized to the iMac. I, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, it could be... Now, you know about our friends' caches. Caches are things that work that has been performed and then is stored and is referred to later. The problem is sometimes caches malfunction or get dirty or... Bad data. Bad data. Um, There is something uh, in most operating systems called a DNS cache, where you look up something, you look up a website, and uh, rather than going out to a DNS server, it's like, hey, I got this cached. Um... It could be that the DNS cache is corrupt. Uh, There is a way, a couple of ways, to clear the DNS cache. So one is you can hop into the terminal and do that. And I found an article over at dreamhost.com that tells you, based on which version of Mac OS you're using, how to clear your DNS cache. So can't hurt to do that. It'll get rebuilt, and then maybe everything, all the problems will go away. Um, Onyx also does this, too. So this is another place I think you can look, is that if you go to Onyx and you go to their cleaning menu, and then their internet menu, well, there's a checkbox for DNS cache, and actually they have a box for browser cache, and a few other internet-related caches as well. So, clear those out as well. Yes. um, Another thing is that you may, what you may want to do to isolate the problem is that there is something called network diagnostics within Mac OS. Um, In system prefs. And we'll link to an article about right. that. And it's, um, yeah, you no, go to system preferences, no. network, and then assist me, and you will get... Oh, yeah. I forgot you can get there that way. Oh, yeah. Wait, so and I was right. You were right, guy. Oh, my God. Well, partially. Well, you, no, you were definitely right. You were right in where to start. So system yeah. preferences, network, I'm going to look right now. And then, yeah, then assist me. And when you hit assist me, you get th- three choices. Cancel, probably not what you want. Diagnostics, and then they have something called assistant. Try those tools while the problem is occurring. Um, I, I don't, personally, I don't know if I've ever had it diagnose a problem for me successfully, but maybe it can get the wheels rolling. Maybe it, it'll yeah. clear something out or get something moving that'll uh, eliminate this problem here. The, you know, while I was reading the question, another thought occurred to me, Dave, here. So it sounds like the iMac is wired and the iPad is wireless. Um, oh. Bad cable? Well, a hardware, a, 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 a wired network connection issue. I mean, it seems weird be. that it wouldn't work, and then all of a sudden work. I don't know if the well, cable. You, you would warming. think it would work faster under a wired connection. Uh, absolutely, but uh, but it's just uh, uh, my observation is that there are two different connections that this thing is providing. One is wireless, and one is wired. I believe it sounds like it's wired. Yeah, it, I you know, there's more than just the DNS cache. I, I would um, I would go in and remove in, in system preferences network and remove uh. the network connection. Just highlight it and hit the minus key, delete it. It's not going to delete your ethernet port. Trust no. me, It'll it's still going to be on the back of your computer. But when you then hit the plus button and add ethernet back in, which is the next step to do, then it creates a whole new profile and that might be the thing. It, honestly, it sounds to me like it has a proxy server turned on where it's looking for like a SOX, S-O-C-K-S proxy yeah. or some kind of auto proxy 
and it's waiting and waiting and waiting for the proxy to respond. It doesn't, and so it falls back to non-proxy mode and goes and looks up the site and connects. Um, and I've, I've, I've had this before where I've been connected to a, ne a proxy network, everything's fine. I go somewhere else, I plug in, and it's like, oh, why is this like so slow? And then you go in and you see, oh, the proxy settings are checked. So you could check that too. Yeah, one other thing to try would yeah. be to go back, if it is a wired network, go back to, uh, you've only got the one connection on your, on your iMac, but chances are back wherever the router is, you've got multiple outputs well, or inputs that you can use. Just try switching to another uh, input. No, yeah, it could be that there's a bad cable or, or yeah. I mean, a bad cable is not going to be resolved by doing no. that. But, but if there's a bad port on the switch, yep. Yeah, well, do you think that if, if it is a problem with the, uh, with the cable, that it's first trying to connect through the wired and oh. then saying, okay, I can't do it through the wired. Let me go ahead and go to the wireless. And that could be the cause of the delay. Ooh. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm not a big fan of having multiple interfaces on, on any machine. I mean, I actually have network profiles that right. have one or the other, not both. Well, you know, one way you could test that would but, be to remove the wireless connection mm -hmm. And see if you're able see to come it, on. See to if the it stops one. working entirely. Right, no. and if it does, then you know that it's either no. it's either the port that you're connected yeah. to or the cable. Now, of course, the other thing is, since wireless seems to be working, is switch the iMac over to wireless yeah, and exactly. eliminate. Yeah, the that's not a good. Sol I mean, <laughs> it's look, a solution, it, but I, it's it also depends on what he's what he's using his. I mean, if he's just online surfing and getting the email, then a wireless connection is fine. Uh, yeah, as long as he's got good connection. Yeah, yeah. if he's you know yeah. skyping or or downloading right. video or anything the rest like that, he definitely would want to go with a wired connection. I had an issue with the iMac in the studio uh, that thankfully was fixed as part of a motherboard repair, but um, the Ethernet port. Something had happened, like probably some kind of power surge strike issue. Yeah, I've had that recently. Yeah, where it would no longer sync at gigabit speeds, even though it was a gigabit port. And, you know, the, obviously the connection on the other end was gigabit. Something in the port on the iMac fried to where it still worked, but only at 100 megabit speeds. And so the only way I could get it to work was in system preferences. I had to go to Ethernet and go to, uh, I think it's, I don't think you go to advanced, I don't have an ethernet connection on this computer, but you go to hardware in the, ether, you know, in the ethernet settings there and choose instead of configure, you know, or set the speed automatically, you manually set it to 100 base TX instead of 1000 base TX. And for me, that fixed the problem. But obviously yeah, it was a short term speeds. solution. Yeah, right. I wound up actually using the other world computing Thunderbolt 2 dock or maybe it was the Thunderbolt 1 dock at the time, but it, you know, their Thunderbolt dock had a gigabit Ethernet port on it. I was like, all right, well, if I can't use the built-in one... Use this one. I'll use that one, yeah. And it's then, got like enough said, bandwidth. Oh, Thunderbolt has... Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah, it, was, it worked great. Yeah, so it's possible that the port itself has become damaged. Or like you said, the port on the Switch could have been... I mean, it, both of them are equally right. susceptible. Yep. And to detect the problem that, uh, like Dave mentioned, there also is... Um, something called network utility. And if you click on the info tab, it then gives you a list of all the interfaces that you have. So for example, I look here now and it says Ethernet, EN0, and it gives a whole bunch of statistics. Now right now I'm not connected by Ethernet, but if I was, it would tell me send packet errors, receive packet errors, and also the link speed. So you may want to make sure, and the link status, and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. Actually, that would have shown you that your connection was dumbed down to 100 from, from gigabit, and then you could be like, oh, right. the port's Yeah, there. but my problem was it tried, it kept trying to negotiate Ethernet. Over and over again. Yeah, of right. course, because it was like, I see, I see gigabit, I, you know, and, and so, yeah, it was a thing. So. Cool stuff. Well, uh, that, I think, is the end of our time limit for our Mac Geek Gab segment. So for those of you listening on the Mac Geek Gab feed, we will now begin Mac my Mac <laughs> segment. So stand by to stand by for that. And those of you that are listening on the My Mac feed, stand by to stand by for the, for the my, Mac stock. For the stuff. Mac stock segment. Man, so easy confusing. for me to say. No, it was no, not. No, it was not. It was probably harder for you <laughs> to listen to. We haven't to. even my started apologies. drinking yet. No, no. That's stone later. cold sober. That's yeah. right. Yeah, maybe that's the problem. Yeah, we need to be drunk. <laughs> you know, the 
I, I'm still amazed it's taken us 666 episodes to get you here, guy. <laughs> I'm not amazed at all. Thank you so much for joining us on Mac Geek Oh, Cab. no problem. Yeah, no you. problem. And I guess, is that it? That's stand it by, now. Stand by, okay. <laughs> stand by, you, you can say it. Stand. Okay, stand by to stand by, and we will all be right back for some Mac stock stuff. You're listening to another great podcast in the MyMac Podcasting Network. My Mac Podcast 665, an unholy amalgamation. Oh, crap. There. You're listening to the G-Mac so smooth. on the MyMac.com podcast. And welcome, everyone, to the So Far No Mistakes My Mac Podcast number 665. We are here at MacStock. Now, I do not have gas this week. No, you don't. I do not have gas. However, I do have probably the most unlikely combination of, uh, of guys that have ever actually agreed on purpose to be on the MyMac.com podcast. I think it was our idea. That's right. It, that makes it worse, Dave. <laughs> and and there were promises made, which we are <laughs> well, under non-disclosure. Right. Well, we uh, we can we can go over those at dinner time. Yes. And you're buying dinner, right? Or is, was I supposed to buy dinner? I thought that's part of the deal here at <laughs> Max Stock been. Conference and Expo. <laughs> well, and if you if you buy a certain ticket, right? It, oh, you you, you got to have the golden ticket. You have to buy Pla- the right ticket. Pla- that's Platinum right. Ticket. The, the right ticket. Uh, we have. Uh, Dave Hamilton and Mr. John F. Braun, and you have to put Mr. before his name from the Mac Geek Gab. Hey, guys. Hey, man. Thanks for having us. <laughs> it was nice to be had. <laughs> <laughs> if only you knew. I only you knew. Had. Yeah, we had. Um, uh, now, now, you guys are going on when? Tomorrow? Uh, uh, John's not speaking. Oh, I, that's right. That's I right. am speaking. Right. So we're recording this on Saturday, the, the 15th. Yeah. yeah, it's the 15th. Yeah. And uh, I am speaking about mesh networks in 20 minutes or less on Sunday. You're not doing a deeper dive for that, though. No. Sure ain't. You probably should have. I prob- <laughs> oh, I offered. <laughs> Was there just, like, no spaces available? Well, I'm going last. So there's really oh, no time okay. for a deep dive after your last. And you got something going on right afterwards anyway. Yeah, I'm actually not going to do that. Uh, oh, there, you're not going to do that? Oh, there's man. a fish concert, folks, happening Sunday night, actually, and Saturday and Friday, uh, about an hour and a half from here. But yeah. logistically, it's going to be a disaster. So I, I, I spent about an hour and a half last night trying to figure planning it, out. it all out. And every piece of it was its own... Nightmare. Like renting the car was its own nightmare, <laughs> you know, and, and really the, the final, the, the straw that broke it was tickets are available, but via StubHub, which is fine, but only for pickup. So I can't do an electronic ticket, which means I have to then stop at some StubHub office in downtown Chicago before I go out via the minor, tiny little artery to Randall's Island, or not Randall's Island, that's New York, um, whatever, Northerly Island here. Right. It's just not going to happen. Oh, so I've sucks. accepted this. Okay. It's hurting me. Well, I, I know that you're a big fish fan. I am. And we're not talking about the Miami Dolphins here. No, no. Never have been a Miami Dolphins fan. <laughs> well, let's see. You're from, uh, what's that area called? New England? The, the New of England. The New of England. So I'm, I'm trying to think about what football team you guys could possibly, possibly. Well, no, we have the champions. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. That's no, right. No, no, no. As a long-suffering Miami Dolphins fan, and I have to say, I hate Belichick with every single fiber of my being, but only because he's not the coach of the Miami Dolphins. Right. <laughs> no, I, I understand that. <laughs> I, I totally Of course. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Is that what the topic of the MyMax segment of this show is? Uh, it wasn't really intended to be, uh, but this is kind of a stream of conscious, consciousness show, as much as it is. So half the time, I just stand there and go... Uh, and that works. It does work. It, people keep keep downloading the show. There you go. So odd. I think it's mostly because of Gaz. Uh, real quick, I wanted to talk about uh, the stuff that's on the, the MyMac website for the week, and I'm doing this so fast. I have none, none of this written down. I'm just going to talk real, real fast. Geekiest show ever, 265, lethargic Skype. Uh, podcast, go download it. 
Uh, Essential Apple Podcast 48. Hey, Garlic Head, it's Keith R., Long Shot Baker. I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure it's a great podcast. We have the New Force EDC in ear monitors. Uh, this is a headphones review. Uh, the Mac Stock 2017 conference photos, which I guess just came up today, because since this is, and that was the last one. So that's all the stuff over at mymac.com. It's gorgeous. Did you, uh, are you the one that rev- reviewed the New Force EDCs? You know, oddly enough, since I, you know, starting back in 2009 when Gaz and I took over uh, the podcast, yeah. I have not been able to write as much as I used to. It, it just, just doesn't seem to be enough time. All right. Well, so, and it sucks because so no, so I love no, writing. So that wasn't you. No, I was going to ask you all me. about them. <laughs> oh, they're great. I love them. Okay. But it wasn't me. But you've used them. No. Okay. Awesome. I just, in general, I, I, I think it's a good idea. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, okay. It's just a good idea. Okay. <laughs> John, how are you today, sir? Fantastic. We have not heard enough from you. It's, it's all been the Guy and Dave show. Speak to yeah. us kind of has been what do you want me to speak to you about <clears throat> we'll be doing an entire mac geek gab segment this show will be released to both of our audiences you know we should probably talk about how this is going to work <laughs> now that we're five minutes in yeah now that we're five minutes in basically we're going to use the same garage band band file so when we're done recording this i'll save the band file we'll put it on a usb stick and i'm laughing because that apparently was a whole big thing for a little while ago um give that band file to dave and he will edit it for uh, the Mac Geek Gab. I'll edit mine for my Mac. And essentially, if you listen to the Mac Geek Gab, you'll hear the Mac Geek Gab part first. Right. And then you'll hear the MyMac part. You've already heard the Mac You've Geek already... Gab part. Right, right, right. Yes. <laughs> well, Which yeah, we that would actually... About See, yet. now we'll have to say this again on the Geek Gab No, part. we won't. We'll just... We'll, well, yeah. I mean, we'll have to give some sort of warning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, after this very sensible part of the podcast, <laughs> there'll be the My Mac part. That's right. Okay, good. Yeah, the people do need to be warned. And then um, uh, the third part, we'll just talk about what happened here at Mac Stock today. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so far, it's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, but let's not ruin that. Oh, that's right. Right, right. We got to yeah. save that. We got to right. save that. Exactly. Um, well, now you flew out here. I did. You but, did. But let's not talk about the Mac Stock stuff. Well, this was just general. Oh, just general. general. Yeah. Yeah, general chit chat. Yeah. And um, we, I, I picked you up at the airport. You did. And along with Wally and Wendy Chu... Cherwinski. Cherwinski. Yes. I always have a lot of trouble with their last name. I don't know why. You might know, if you don't know who Wally is, you might uh, have seen his work if you watched any of the multi-camera shots that were done of the Macworld All-Star Band years ago. He edited all of those together and sort of oh, spearheaded I did not know that. that movement. Yeah. Yeah, that was Wally's brainchild and and labors of love. You know, of everything that happened at, um, I, I guess we're not really talking about anything in particular, <laughs> everything that happened at, at the Macworld Expo, I think my favorite part, uh, what, well, uh, honestly, one of my favorite parts was the Cirque du Mac parties. And, you know, even more so, because when you're at the Macworld Expo in, in the... The, the way that we all were, where you know we're covering the event and we're spending a lot of time in the press room, either recording a podcast or writing about the the expo or or talking to vendors or the rest of that, we don't really get to see a whole lot of the show. You know, we're walking the floors looking at, at cases, which yeah. the last few years was yeah, we experienced the show very differently from uh, other people from other people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the the community that we were dealing with was mostly other press guys. Because it was all in the press room. But then when you'd go to like the Smile Party or Cirque du Mac or uh, what was the big part, the big Macworld Microsoft parties they used to have? Uh, Macworld used to have parties. And, and then prior to all of that were the Mac the Knife parties. I never got a chance to go to any of those. Okay, yeah. But that was where you would actually get the, to hang the out. community. Yeah. The community spirit from all the different people that would go to uh, the Macworld Expo. And you would see some of the same faces every year. But you'd see a lot of new faces, too. The, part of the problem with that, though, was that it was so big that you couldn't always spend a lot of quality time talking to people. No, plus there was a loud band playing at uh, Cirque du Mac, so you really yeah. couldn't talk to people. Well, the, the 2007 Macworld Expo was Cheap Trick at the, at the Microsoft oh, and party. At the, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the, and then at the, the next right. year, I think it was Devo. 
I remember them once. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Devo. I think Modest Mouse was in between Cheap Trick and Devo, I want to say. But Maybe. I might be wrong about that. Well, they had a DJ one year that yep. was really super lame. Yep. You know, is, how do you they go from... They had Little Feet the final year, right? Was it Maybe Little it feet? wasn't the final year, but they definitely had Little Feet play. Yeah. God, I, I, I hope I didn't miss that one because I love Little Feet. Oh, it was killer. It was over at Mezzanine where they had the, you know, and then they had Paul, uh, Paul Kent's band, the House Rockers, played one of those too. Right. Right. And then, well, and then, of course, the, the House Rockers and you guys all played, you know, the Mac World All-Star Band, which included a lot of the House Rockers. Uh, it only included one House Rocker. Really? It was I, just Paul. I yeah. thought that there were other people that were involved in that. No, I mean, there, there were other people involved. It wasn't just drums well, and guitar. Well, I mean, from, from the House Rockers. No, no, it was just, just Paul. Okay, because yeah. you guys always had such a tight set. It surprised me to find out that you really only had one serious practice session. Yeah. Before that, before the actual before the actual event, we had one practice session. It wasn't necessarily serious. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, you, you guys are no, like we so worked serious. hard. Yeah, yeah, we worked hard. And uh, just everybody that, that would spend the time to put those together, it was just so so wonderful. And when it all went away, I was I was kind of kind of heartbroken. I mean, even though I hated the the flights out there. And and trying to get back with, on the red eyes, leaving on, on you know that last night after at the end of the show, just t- to be out there, knowing that I was going to be out there the next year would help kind of get me through. And I know that at the end of the 2014 one, was that the last one that they were kind of saying, "Oh yeah, well we'll see you all next year." I think everybody knew at that point that the writing was on the wall. Yeah, it was literally on the wall. Like the dates weren't posted. Yeah. 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 <sighs> so. You know, so no more Macworld, but we have other yeah. things too that have kind of taken the place of that. And yeah. we'll talk about that in the third section, uh, which is, you know, one of them being this, this conference that we're here at today. And um, do you think that, that smaller conferences like these can, can take the place of something like Macworld, or do you think that it actually really needs to? I, I don't think there's a place for a conference like Macworld anymore. I, I, I mean, I, I think. I think this is the only type of thing that makes sense. I mean, Macworld was a conference for consumers. Right. And it, and, and it had to make money at that, right? It needed to be a profitable venture. For well, IDC or IDG. IDG. Right. And, and I mean, that's fine. But there's like, it, it doesn't make sense for exhibitors en masse, you know, a hundred exhibitors or 150 exhibitors or 300 exhibitors to spend that kind of money to be in front of those 20, consumers. People. Yeah. 20,000 people, even if it's 30, I mean, it's just like the web has changed that. Apple likes to take well, credit for it and say it's Apple stores, but it's not. But there was a point where I think you, you saw the decline of the event not not the quality but the uh, the value proposition and that there was the year that apple decided to say yes. you know what we're not going to show up we don't feel we need to because as they said um and you hinted at you can come to our store and learn all about our stuff you don't need yeah. to come to Macworld to learn about yeah. it and, and to a certain extent i think they were right well they were um but it it was just so unfortunate that that and I, th- I think the other thing that I did like, the direction that it took towards the end, um, I personally, um, it could just be my own take on things or to provide value, is I would always blow by the booths of the big guys like Adobe and FileMaker and, and things because I'm like, I already know what they do. To me, one of the biggest values of going to Macworld was when they started doing this little as we called it, uh, 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 what, what do we call it? Tiny Town, we called it. Yeah. <laughs> the little yeah. shanties where you had oh, yeah. small developers who all are struggling for the most part. You know, houses that have, you know, less than 50 or 25 or, you know, maybe one or two people. How are you possibly going to sell and promote your product? It could be the best product in the world, but you, you need... You need a presence. You need a way to get exposure. And I would do my best to find people that were little guys that were making these really innovative things and helping promote them. And, well, you, uh, do you know what was cool about Tiny Town? Uh, well, I mean, besides the fact that it was just cool, they'd have, they had all those round tables, and then you would have up to four vendors at each one of these little round tables. And it was like literally 
one side would be uh, a guy with some kind of graphics program. Uh, the next one would be medical technology. The one after that would be you know the world's greatest audio scrubber. And the one after that would be uh, an iOS game. And it would all be on that one table. So yeah. you, you could walk around that table and as an interviewer have 20 minutes of content. Right. Just, just talking to those guys there. I, yeah. The, the problem was, you know, each of those people paid a thousand bucks right. to be there. That's doesn't it really doesn't matter how many of those people you have. You're not going to even pay the rent on the space. Well, do you know what part of the problem with that was um, after Apple left? Yeah. And I'm sure you noticed this as well. There were less and less press there. Well, there were less attendees in general there. I know, but I mean, yeah. did you go to the very last year? Of course. How many people did you see in the press room ever? Oh, it was empty. Yeah. Yeah. I think my Mac had like, we I think we had like six or seven people there. Yeah. We were the biggest contingent. Yeah, that's probably right. I think you, if, you, if you had six or seven, that was more than we brought that year. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how do you, and, and, and you know, the writing, I guess the writing on the wall was, was literally at that point when... Because if you don't have press there, then even especially the the smaller vendors. Yeah. Well, it, it just there's it it's like I said, there's no place for a con, a large you know twenty thirty thousand consumer show. There's just no business model for it. Well, you you go to CES, right? Yeah, that's not consumer focused at all. CES, in fact, if you are a consumer, you cannot attend. Really? Yeah, it's only for press distributors. Uh, you, you know, tire kickers, but you have to be someone in the industry. Now, they are very loose about that definition, right? But that is what it is. Uh, so, and and really, the show floor is a mess. If, if from a press angle, and people that listen to Matt Geek have heard us say this, that the show floor doesn't make sense for press um, because it's all when, it's not it's not segmented in well, any particular. Well, it is way? segmented, but when you go up to a, to somebody's booth. You know, you're competing for their time with people that have interests that are widely varied from yours. And frankly, most people are there uh, looking to get distribution for their whatever their products right. are or, or are going to be. So somebody from Best Buy ranks a lot higher than, you know, somebody perhaps even from like, you know, the New York Times, let alone Mac Observer. So it the, you know, there are press events specific press events like the Pepcoms and Showstoppers and Unveileds that work really well. And we go out for those, but the show floor is almost worthless. So you think you think that the days of the big consumer event-based shows are, are done? There, there are none left. I mean, CES, despite being called the Consumer Electronics Show, is not for consumers. So I don't think there are any large consumer, uh, tech consumer events left. Well, there's... There's one coming up that they have at the Javits every year called Photo Plus Expo. I would argue that, that it's it's for photographers. Professionals. Uh, and semi-pros. But, um, okay. But not consumers. Not just um, users. You, you have to be pretty serious yeah. about photography. To uh, attend or to, well, to, to either, exhibit? Well, uh, to either someone who makes money from photography or somebody who really wants to learn about the craft. I mean, they have, you know, showcase, uh, uh, conference sessions, you know, you can learn lots of new things because they have a lot of top-notch, um, you know, Kelby, you probably heard of him, you know, he, he does things there. And um, I get value because, you know, I fancy myself a not terrible photographer and I like the technology <laughs> and, uh, and, is that what you have on your business card? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not John F. Braun, not terrible photographer. <laughs> Esquire. Esquire. When I go to that show, I should get that made up. But um, the interesting thing is that there's there's an overlap. That the reason I get value is that I like photography, but there's also an overlap between the people that you see at Photo Plus because I hope you're tweeting that. Dave. They have well, they have lots of uh, uh, you know all the NAS vendors because if you uh, you know if you take photography, you're probably going to need a place to a store the space, stuff and right. not lose it. And so you know you get the Drobo and the Synology and QNAP and all those guys there. A lot of software people there that make the imaging software and the you know photo software so mm -hmm. um it's an interesting intersection of different markets that i think does provide value but but i'll, I'll agree with dave yeah it's not pure consumer um maybe prosumer yeah. i'll say so so those days are gone then it, yeah they've been gone for a long time oh, in fact sucks. i think they were gone i think macworld was probably the last one and i think it lasted longer than it should have 
Uh, not that I'm sad that it lasted, but right. but just from a sort of general s- standpoint, I think the desire of 25,000 people for it to continue as long as possible kept it continuing as long as possible and longer than it should have. And that's, listen, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just, right. Yeah, just how it is. Well, it, it, it's, it's too bad, not just because of the show itself, but just because that that community spirit i mean you think back to when user groups were huge in the you know the 80s and the 90s maybe even in the late 70s yeah and yeah. as soon as the internet became a thing user groups disappeared almost over I'm not, I'm not i'm saying not all of them no there, but there are a still lot some, of them there are a lot of them disappeared the almost overnight yeah, I, yeah for sure uh, i belong to the washington apple pie okay and they were a pretty big group there for a while yeah and then right after um God, it was probably mid two thousands as the internet was starting to get real big. Yeah, I I went to an event there and they, you know, I hate to say it like this, it was almost like God's waiting room. It was almost everybody there that was like really really super old. Yep. And you know, this isn't. I, I'm not slamming user groups in particular because there's a lot of value there in belonging to a user group. Um. The user groups that that have turned that corner have be- made their user groups into social clubs. Right. right. Where and that's where it had to go. It, yeah. It there's the meeting, mm-hmm. and whenever the meeting is, it, it I've seen it work in the evenings, and I've seen it work, you know, like on a Saturday morning kind of thing. Right. But everybody shows up because a they like all the other people they're going to see, and yes, they have a shared interest in you know this whatever hardware that we call Apple or whatever it is, but. They're all there for, you know, pizza and beer afterwards or the lunch that you always go to. And it's this monthly social club. Right. And I, look, I mean, that's great. I And I, I mean, this year alone, I think I've flown all over the country speaking at like six different user groups. And I, they're great because it's this social club. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I go and I speak. And then my favorite part is after. After. Yeah. And I'm not alone in that. And I'm okay with it having been the speaker. You know, yeah, yeah. So okay. Just fun. I hope I didn't piss anybody off with that God's waiting room thing. Well, you probably did, but okay. Yeah, you know, you not the first you time. You weren't wrong. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we are we're over twenty minutes, so we should probably wrap this up, and then we're going to get into your guys' stuff, and then the the last section we'll talk about all the stuff that happened here today in Max Talk. Sounds good. All right. So everyone, please stand by to stand by here in God's waiting room, and we will. Be right back. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to my Mac 665, the third section, and Mac Geek 666, the third section. Three for three. We are three for three. Uh, I'm Dave (laughs) Hamilton, of course. We are here at the McHenry County College in Crystal Lake, Illinois, at Mac Stock, uh, just ending the first day. Say that name, I dare you. The Liked Conference Center. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice man. done. <laughs> I'm going to make it up. Okay, good. Yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do. Guy Searle to my right, John F. Braun to my left, and uh, Max Stock Day 1, I, I, I was going to say is almost over, but that's actually not true because the best part about Max Stock is the camaraderie, getting to see everyone, all of that. And that continues well into the evening with the third annual Barry's Mac Barbecue thing that, it, yeah, that it changes continues every to year. evolve. <laughs> right. Let's see. The first year was at his house. Was at his house, which was brilliant. The house with the amazing faucets and cats. Their house is and gorgeous. cats. The cats are gorgeous. Cool. And it poured rain. And oh they, my god! I yeah. mean, it like poured rain. Yeah. Uh, but they they put a tent in their backyard that was big enough for everybody, and it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then last year they had it right outside the doors here. Right. Yeah. The they had right. the the great pork chops. Yeah, I missed that, but I remember hearing that's where it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, they yeah. couldn't have booze in the parking lot. No, because uh, this is a school. Right. So well, it's a dry school. Some schools let you have booze on campus. Okay. okay. Not this one. Well, well students certainly, college students certainly don't consume. No. Oh, it, at no. some school at, at, at I, UNH, students of age can drink. It's not a dry campus. Oh, it's just I weird. I, I think his I think his point was that oh. co- co- no college oh. kids drink ever. 
Oh, even like like underage college students don't drink. Or do no, keg yeah. stands or any kids sort of in general. shenanigans? Never drink. Never drink. But but this this year's event is properly titled Barry's Midwest Mac Mingle yes. After Party. Yes. And there's going to be a band. There's going to be I food. Hear. I know. And and the, the great thing is, you know, the the total cost of the conference for both days, including the Midwest Mac Mingle, was two hundred dollars. I mean, and that was the most that you could spend. That was without the discounts and everything else. You got two full days of the conference. You got lunch on both days. You got the Midwest Mac Mingle. You got a T-shirt. You got uh, a, a a Stein glass. Yep, yep. John's holding up his right there. Yeah. I believe that there's a coffee mug. I mean, just all of the... There is... And I was talking about this on the last uh, My Mac podcast. You couldn't go to any major city in the United States, spend $200, and have two full days of entertainment like this. So you're saying that Mike needs to charge more for Mac stock. And and when he does, it's we will fault. all pay for it. And no. It, and it'll be my fault. No, it I I'll, I'll take the blame for it. Oh, no. <laughs> but but he Guy should charge will more for this. Pay for like, it. Like this I is will. there is a greater value here than than you are paying for. Even if he doubled the price, that's still probably half of what really this conference should cost. And yeah. part of that is that Mike puts in so much work and he does. And I don't. I honestly don't know the financials of the conference, but my guess is he's not making much, if anything, from this. I doubt I, he's making. I know how to do either. math, right? And also, I want to give a big shout out to, and I and I now including myself in this group, but it's okay. Uh, a shout out of thanks to all of the speakers who mm-hmm. travel here on their own dime. Speakers are not paid. Speakers don't pay to be here, so we right. get food and 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 that sort of thing. But airfare and, and the the mingle and right. the mingle, right? But airfare and hotels. That's uh, all on us. Or travel and hotels are are on us, even though we're speaking here. So, it, I mean, it, this is a labor of of, of love. love for for many many people. And Mike Potter, Barry Falk, and Dave Ginsburg, I think this year uh, shouldered a, a healthy amount of the load. So, oh, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt at yeah. all. And it it and the thing is, um, especially if you've been to smaller conferences. Because the, the people that put these conferences together don't necessarily, you know, have a, a large budget. Right. A lot of times that shows in what you see, but not here. No, it's true. Right. This feels like, and a I've been to A much bigger them. show. It, it feels like a $1,000 conference. Yeah. It really does. And, you know, for people who have never been here before, the Leucht Leucht Conference Center, that is... An amazing small, large conference room. Yes. The sound system is great. Uh, the the people that work in IT here at McHenry Community College has been very very responsive, and you know even even the, the cafeteria workers that put together the lunches. Oh, it's, it's just stellar. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I th- I think the other part that that makes it great for this area is just how great the locals are. Yeah, and not not even talking about the people that that actually are here at the conference, but the the people that you run into in the hotels, in the shops, in the restaurants, you know, anywhere you're going, just warm, open people. What can I do to help you? It, you know, that kind of thing. It's a great area for a conference. I will say the one sort of the one difference, if I'm going to nitpick, and I might as well, sure, because I just put a price tag on it, so now I can nitpick. Uh, if if the one difference between this and a thousand dollar conference is that all of the events for this, the hotel, the conference center, the mingle, all of it are in different locations and you need to travel by, by vehicle. Mm-hmm. 10 minutes, I mean, it's nothing's hugely far apart, but you are traveling, you know, 10 minutes to do this, 10 minutes Thank to do that. Thank God that phones have GPS. Yes, <laughs> but you either you need to rent a car or they do have shuttle service that they're providing. Yeah, but, between the hotels and, and the college. if... They were to move the price way up. I would hope that as part of that, they would consolidate. They could find a venue where they could consolidate everything and just have it where our rooms are upstairs from the conference room. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be a huge difference. Well, you know, it's. We, I was actually talking to Mike about this uh, Thursday when yeah. I got here, and he was he was saying, you know, it would be kind of cool to also have it in a different location. Yes. And he mentioned Orlando. Okay. And yeah. I, you know, I thought about that, and you know, I'm a Floridian, 
Orlando, I, I think, might not be the best place right. for expensive. a small conference like right. this. Not only for the expense, but because of, of all the major distractions. You want a place where, where there are not... I, I like... A conference like this to not have a ton of distractions around it, like doing it, and not that I would suggest it, but doing it in Vegas would be bad. Yeah. Because now instead of us all saying, "Well, we we literally have nothing else to do other than go to the Mac Mingle," I, I don't mean to diminish <laughs> yeah, the no, value no, of the no, Mac I Mingle. Get, I get it. But it's I like it, if yeah. it's like either that or. Gosh, you know, I could just go down the street and see the Cirque du Soleil Love Show, which, you know... I, or a Blue I, I, Men group or, or, Blue or Men, whatever. Yeah, like, you, you, people are going to disperse. They're going to bring their families and, and disperse. And, and and that does diminish, to me, the value of the conference. Well, do you know what I suggested was Daytona? Yeah, uh, okay. Because, you know, dur- during the day, yeah, you got the beach. Yeah, right. But at night... You don't have the beach. Now, there are there is other Light entertainment. stuff, sure. You know, yeah. but... Uh, I think Daytona would be like a great place for something like yeah. this. Yeah, I, I mean, there there are towns around. I, it would be nice to do it somewhere that's right near an airport. Yeah. Yeah. So. And you got Orlando and Daytona airports right, right there. That's right. That's true. And Jacksonville yeah, yeah. not that far away. Right, right. Now, I have a technology angle here. It's the first time I have ever done this. Well, there mm-hmm. are a number of things that I did for the first time here. Well, maybe not the first I time. I heard the second time. That. Yeah, well, what happens no. at Max Stock uh, stays at Max Stock. Stock, John. <laughs> no. So the first thing is that um, my airport is a lot better now about uh, direct flights. So I got a direct flight from Bradley to um, uh, ORD. O'Hare? Right. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. Second, let's, let's not talk about the pickup. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the second thing that I enjoyed was that at least on this American flight. Uh, they had in-flight entertainment on Wi-Fi for free. That was kind of neat. I liked that. Yeah. Because I had my MacBook with me, and I sure. remembered to bring my headphones this time. Um, now, the third thing that I was able to do, and this is really neat, so uh, the official hotel here is called the Hampton Inn McHenry, which is a Hilton property. The Hilton app not only let me check in and choose my room, but it also has a digital key in that I can use my phone to oh, that open is cool. my door lock. So my phone is my key. Uh, it's not doing NFC. Dave, I think, knows more about it than I do. But it's doing it, I guess, through Wi-Fi or cellular or whatever. But it somehow knows to tell my lock to open, to open up as you come when up I to press it. the button. And I think that's pretty darn cool. It's the first time I've ever run into that. Yeah, I'm actually curious about how it works. Because even though the iPhone has NFC, um, it does not currently allow any use of NFC other than Apple Pay. Now, iOS 11 opens that up a little bit. Carefully. Carefully. Right. But still not to the level that, you know, the, the third-party app could well, just, could be like, Bluetooth. drive at it. Yeah. It, it, it could be. But you would need a Bluetooth receiver at almost every door for that to work because the Bluetooth, range is so limited. Bluetooth well, receivers are cheap. Well, they're ready so electronic. That's true. That's, especially a BTLE yeah. receiver. Yeah. Right. And they're already, I mean, the keys are NFC or something like that. I don't, maybe it's not NFC with the keys. Well, they're back. Normally, I think most are MagStripe. No, they're not MagStripes here. Oh. They're, they're, they're proximity keys. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how it works. I, it is. Okay. It, it, uh, on Hilton's site, it says, on the day of arrival, the digital key will be available once the room is ready. When the smartphone is in range of the room, a signal is sent through Bluetooth to unlock the door. The registered guest then clicks the button in the app to unlock the room. No need to stop at the front desk. Just head straight to relaxation. So, yeah. So, there you go. It's Bluetooth. Okay. That would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be nice if the phone, you know, if yeah. iOS let... I, I mean, I get why Apple sort of is protective about this. I don't actually get it at all. I mean, the fact that they could, you know, allow a third-party app but to I, use... You know what? You know what it is? They don't want to open it up for... Uh, uh, Samsung Pay and Google Pay and all the rest any, of these. And that's what would happen. Exactly. Any non-Apple Pay, they... They oh, don't want that to happen. Oh, right. And if they let third-party apps do whatever they wanted with NFC... Yep. Huh. Yeah. Okay. All and, right. Fair enough. I mean, let, let's face it. Apple Pay... I know we're getting away from what we were going to talk about. It doesn't matter. Um, Apple Pay is going to be one of the future big sources of revenue for Apple. I mean, this is I think this is really the beginning of Apple practically becoming a bank. 
Well, well they it, take a little, just very little piece. Just that but they little take bit. A very little, and that's why right. I think in some countries or some some banks are resistant to deploy it, or some stores like a, a CVS, I think, right. <laughs> I don't know why CVS. Well, I think I think the reason why it. like CVS and some of those other uh, companies didn't want Apple Pay wasn't so much because Apple was taking a little chunk. It was because Apple also wasn't giving back any information on the people that were using it. Apple right. is very had, protective of the privacy of the people that use and it. And I remember CVS tried to roll out this disaster. Of yeah, it was CVS and Walmart and a couple of other companies. And it, you know, they made a big splash. I can't even remember what the hell the name of it was now. Current C. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one the, of the more value people found out about it, yeah. the worse it looked. And then all of these companies that were part of this consortium started getting hacked. And it was like, yeah, let, let me give you my credit card information because that's that I can tell you're 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 very sensitive. You're the ones, yeah, yeah. But, very sensitive. But I think to some promotional materials I saw for the platform, they made a point to the merchants saying, we can give you lots of valuable data to right. make the experience valuable for and that you. Out too, not not the consumer, but you, the merchant. The merchant, and right. 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 So right. it wasn't about it wasn't and, and you see, I, I work in a help desk. I, I work in customer relations. Yeah. And the hardest thing that I have to do when trying to implement a change is convincing the people on the back end that it's more important that whatever the service is is easier for the people that are going to use it than the people that have to administer it. Because the more the easier it is for the person that's using it, the more people will use it. In of which course. case, uh, yeah. yeah, but they don't see it that way. They see it as, well, what am I getting out of it right now? And what you're getting out of it right now is completely unimportant. It's you, you're you're trying to build a platform f in, with this technology, and the rest of it, as far as data information and the rest of that. That can come later. You first have to get people to use it and to trust it. And if they don't trust it, they won't use it, and then it goes away. And currency is a good example of that. Well, and Apple is a great example of the of of doing that right. Yeah. Right. They they notoriously will roll something out in a very feature limited way. I mean, us geeks start ranting about, oh, why didn't if they only do? It if could only do this. right, my certain corner case isn't covered. This sucks, but. They find out what, you know, it, it's the spend, you know, focus on 80% of your customer base. And, and make it a good experience for them. And make it a good experience. Yeah, worry about that because it, the, the person that doesn't have that weird edge case covered, well, okay, they're not going to be the happiest. But as long as the things that they do with it work... And the things that they do are the things that most people want to do. Mm -hmm. It it definitely creates uh, value. Trust. Well, it, yeah, it creates it, it, value. It's added value. Yes. Not for only everybody. for the consumer, right. But in the long run, for the people that are not only going to administer it, but for the people that are are, are taking the payment on the other end of it. Yeah. So, and this is something that uh, Google doesn't understand. This is something that Samsung certainly doesn't understand. And it, it's something that all of these I think, companies actually, that I are think dealing, Google understands it. Well, they may understand it now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because yeah. Google Pay is still... Well, I'm not talking about Google Pay. I'm just saying in a general sense. I think oh. Google grocks that. Maybe. I don't know. They, no, yeah, maybe still, they don't. I mean, you have to they remember, throw a lot of features what, what is, what is who, you know, Who's Google's customers? It's not us. Oh, no. No, it's the advertisers. Exactly. Right. You know, and That's true. I mean, I use a lot of Google services, and I get that you know, free comes with a price, right? For and, sure. You know, just and again, just because something is free doesn't mean it's free as in beer. That you know, they're not doing this. They're they're not sitting there rolling out this office like product to you and saying, "Oh, here you are. I am so happy you're using our product for free, and we Thank just you. want you to love us." Yes. Yeah, and that's okay. We, to you be, know what? To be fair, though, the fact that Google Docs and you know I, I work in the cloud. Sure. Th the fact that those things c can exist is magic. Fifteen is. years ago, I mean, yes. the fa you you have a fully functional word processor that multiple people across the globe 
can, can edit. Co- collaborate on simultaneously, yep. and it lives only in your web browsers. Securely. This is magic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost magic today, yep. let alone 15 years ago. So it is cool that they, that they I mean, because they yes, were really the first ones. Yes, it is. But your point is still valid. It is. Yeah. And, you know, as, as long as you're willing, as long as you understand going in that everything you do that's related to something that they can sell to someone else, that they're going to do this. Yeah. You know, and as long as you go in knowing that and you're okay with that, then, you know, fine. Use Google services. Um, I personally use mostly, you know, Apple Pages and Numbers and all the rest of that because as of right now, Apple isn't selling my information to other people. I mean, I, I go to Amazon and I look up shoes and then all of a sudden I go to web pages all over the globe and I see lots of advertisements for shoes. Mm-hmm. That's not a coincidence. No. That is no, not a coincidence. No, but that's ending. I, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think we will see that ending. So Apple is doing it with, with Safari with their, their... Well, this is their revenge against yeah. them kind of stealing yeah. the look and feel of the iPhone. Well, but, you know, as someone who's been in the advertising industry since before Google existed, mm-hmm. the human mind has not changed. Not mine. Right. But in general, <laughs> like like this whole thing about tracking clicks and all of that, it, it is not the most valuable thing about ads on, on the Internet. It, you know, I, and I've, I famously had, had Andrew Green, who has done all kinds of things. He's at 12 South now, but he, he was with DLO and all, all kinds of stuff. He once said to me, he says, who counts the success of a billboard by the number of cars that crash into it? <laughs> right. But, <laughs> that is such a great billboard. Yeah, bam, right. That's that's actually bad for business. But, you know, Google had this period of, you know, about 12 years where they sort of have everybody focused on this one metric. It's not a, a worthless metric. It's just not the only one, and it's not the most important one. And and I think we're finally seeing that particular bubble bursting. And, and even Google is changing some of the ways that they're marketing their ads and that sort of thing. I, I think they're always going to be in, in the advertising business. That's that's their thing. That's their thing, right. But, but they are changing the way that is presented to the customer uh, so that they still can, can uh, you know, be paid, <laughs> which is good. It, and, and Apple, with, with what they're doing in Safari and iOS 11 and, and Mac OS High Sierra, is great. You know, compartmentalizing all those cookies and, and keeping that crazy tracking from, from happening. Right. It's good. I, I mean, it, Absolutely. It, it is good. The, re, the whole retargeting business in ads, uh, I've said enough. You don't, because we're talking about Mac stock? Well, we? actually we were, and then we, <laughs> then we weren't. But during your segment, Mac we, talked a lot about, we talked a lot about Mac stock, so it's okay, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, as far as I know, there's going to be a Mac stock 20, 2018, and uh, hopefully the people that listen to the MyMac.com podcast and the people that listen to the Mac Geek Gab will believe us. And we're, you know, I mean, we're not we're not blowing smoke up your ass here. This is This is really... <laughs> A great con. This is no, a you, concert. You, this a great conference. Yeah, you should come to this next year. What I've, yeah. what I noticed for this one. So we, we missed a year, Dave and I. But um, this time around, based on user or attendee feedback, they tailored some of the sessions. Yeah. So some were deep dives, and some were quick and dirty. Because honestly, well, that's what well. The then you had what Tim and I did. I'm not sure that that really. You did a game show. It was awesome. It <laughs> yeah, was no. It was. it was the perfect post lunch yeah. thing. It, uh, honestly, the only better time to do it would have been three o'clock, when when everybody would normally kind of hit that slump of right. Right. But instead, we did this at three o'clock. Well, it kept, so it yeah. kept everyone's good. minds active. It totally did. We, yeah, it was a perfect digestion. There were valuable prizes yes. awarded. Um, lots lots of larfs. We guy sang. I, well, a little bit. He kept his shirt on. I did. Thank goodness for that. Everybody was happy about that. Um, Still are. You know, if, <laughs> and I laughed, I cried, I learned something about myself. No, actually, I did learn a few things. And we did actually have some challenges from the studio audience. I believe at least one of the answers that they had was not entirely correct. You'll yeah. have to come to Mac Stock to experience it for yourself. Yeah, well, I, I'm pretty sure uh, as long as, as Tim is willing to do it again next year, I'm sure he's going to want a little more... 
little more input for me if we do this again. Uh, he was actually talking about maybe doing like two half hour ones on like Saturday and Sunday. But I honestly think that the the one session for 45 to 50 minutes is actually uh, better because... Yeah, it, you don't need to do it twice. Yeah. It, it, would, it would be repetitive on day two. I, well, not only that, but if you, th- if you think about what we did, like the first five, ten minutes of it... Yeah, it gets everybody up to speed. Yeah, where yeah. it's like, okay, we're going to end... You know, we're just... We're doing this to have fun. We're having a good time. And, and, you know, don't worry if you don't know what the answers are because we're basically going to give it to you. You know, right. we didn't want to walk away with the prizes. We wanted people right. to have the, the goal prizes. goal is to win, folks. Right. Yep. At all costs. At all costs. So, um... We are, oh my God, we're at like an hour 20 right now. Yeah. Um, I think we are going to end this this joint uh, Mackie Gab 666 <laughs> and Mac, uh, Mac, oh, my Mac, God, I can't even think of the name of my own podcast. My Mac 665. My Mac Podcast 665. But before we go, uh, John, if people wanted to get a hold of you, how the hell would they do it? Hell 666. It's all coming together. Um, I don't know. I guess the, probably the best way would be uh, I'm on the Twitter, mm-hmm. uh, John F. Braun. Uh, our podcast is on the Twitter as Mac Gab. So those are two ways to reach me. Yeah. And, and I uh, understand you, that you can also be reached at feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I believe you said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. No, I'm going to have to correct both of you. Okay, I believe it's feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Wait, so you're saying it's not feedback? At MacGeekGap.com. No, but premium listeners can email us at premium at MacGeekGap.com. I do want to thank our sponsors, Eero and Otherworld Computing, for this episode. Also, Smile Software and Barebones for their continued support of MacGeekGap. And everybody for uh, for doing what you do. Yeah. And yeah. how can they get a hold of you, Dave? Oh, at Dave Hamilton on Twitter is perfect. And you can reach me. Uh, I, guy at MyMac.com is my email address. My uh, Twitter handle is MacPettit. Squawk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to Gaz just jumping in and doing that. When Got it. I say Mac Parrot, it's like, no, and it no, didn't happen. Okay, good enough. So uh, I think that is going to do it for the <laughs> evening. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'll get together tomorrow because I'll have all this set up again tomorrow. There you go. And uh, we'll, we'll just have some more fun. And uh, in the meantime, you know, stay safe, be nice to everyone, and have a great day. Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you. Hey, Guy. Yeah. Is there one thing before you leave our Mac Geek Gab listeners? Is there one thing that you could you could share? Uh, like one final bit of advice? Yeah, if they haven't learned all four things that they needed to learn, if there's just just one maybe left, I would say that that last thing that they need to learn is don't get caught. Made on a Mac. <laughs> Wah, 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 wah.